So good morning. Um, and today we're going to look at the very troubled times of the Reformation and see the impact that the Reformation is going to have on images. And I, I'm sure that you already have a pretty good idea about it, but we'll refresh your memory on a few points. So as usual, um, my notes, uh, historical notes there uh, show the, that Reformation was not the first attempt uh, to reform the church uh, or to separate from the church. There definitely were many previous dissents, as you can see the great schism in, um, between 1378 and 1416, when the Pope was under the pressure of the French king um, brought into France. Uh, this gave a chance to the king to have more um, influence on the papacy. And so this is the, that uh, period in the 15th century uh, where we see the erection of the, 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 the huge uh, papal palace in Avignon. Uh, but this is definitely once the schism is resolved uh, and the papacy goes back to Rome, it's going to weaken uh, the papacy because uh, they have to um, really uh, work out many uh, questions of authority uh, with France and with other countries in Europe. Uh, the, another of these uh, descent comes from John Wycliffe, who lived between three, uh, 1320 and 1384, and he was against papal authority. Um, and he was really uh, trying to push the idea of predestination, which is to this point something I have never understood. Anyway, that's very personal. Uh, Jan Haas uh, was the last one to, to really uh, try to secede from the church. Uh, he was himself influenced by John Wycliffe of England. He argued the law of God, not the Pope. Uh, were the foundation of the Christian church. And he was, as it happened to others too, he was burned at the stake in 1415 during the Council of Constance. Uh, but definitely his ideas uh, had a strong influence on the states of Europe and on Martin Luther himself. So in a quick um, few lines, the Reformation starts really when Martin Luther who is that Augustinian monk uh, living in Wittenberg posted 95 pieces for debate on the door of the local palace church. And this, by the way, was not unique because uh, Wittenberg was a university uh, town. And uh, this was a way whenever anybody wanted to debate something, they would go and stick it on the door of the palace church. Uh, in among these 95 theses, he challenges these famous indulgences that we talked a lot about. Uh, indulgences that were literally pieces of papers that were sold by priests to try to uh, people and give them the feeling that they were going to shorten their uh, way to paradise. And so that uh, instead of being in the limbo or uh, the, in the purgatory for a long period of time, um, this was supposed to give them a direct line to the heavens. Also, he challenges the authority of the Pope. Uh, he challenged uh, also uh, the cult of Mary that had taken a very large proportion uh, Simony also, uh, the fact that uh, the clerics were selling their, uh, their job, if you want, their, their post, their position uh, for money. And this was not supposed to happen. And he also promotes salvation through faith. Uh, there is also one point uh, that is a very difficult point, and not only with Martin Luther, but from Martin Luther on with others in the Protestant movement uh, is the idea of the Eucharist and uh, the presence of Christ in the Eucharist as just a representation or is it the real as the Catholics claim 
uh, that uh, this is the real presence at the time of the consecration, that the body of Christ uh, is literally included in the, the host and uh, the blood of Christ in the wine. Uh, so, uh, shortly after Martin Luther post uh, the 95 Thesis, Zwingli in Switzerland is going to start his own movement that doesn't go hand in hand with Martin Luther. It's, it's a rather uh, separate movement. Same time, there is the, the movement of the Anabaptism. Uh, the later forms were much smaller, but among uh, the, the main idea is that uh, people that are baptized should be adult enough that they can understand what is happening. And so they, they discounted, if you want, the, the idea of um, baptizing uh, children and, and uh, infants. Coming out of that movement will be different variety uh, that developed to, to be, for example, the Mennonites, the Amish and the Uterite. In England, uh, starting in 1529 and then concluded by the official uh, nomination of Henry VIII, who will become the head of the English church. And you know that uh, Henry, the, the whole problem started with the Pope being opposed to Henry uh, divorcing his first wife. Uh, in France, uh, we have uh, uh, Jean Calvin, uh, Jean Calvin, Jean Codin originally um, is uh, writing a lot of uh, his own ideas as Institute of the Christian Religion. And this is from his movement that will come out the Huguenots and we'll see a little bit more, but particularly the Calvinism uh, that will become prevalent in the low countries and part of Germany. Um, so Jean Calvin had to leave uh, France to Switzerland, fearing for his life, and he will settle in Geneva, that was an uh, independent city as far as religion was concerned. Uh, and then finally, all these uh, descents are going to be resolved, more or less, if we can call it, in the German territories in 1555 by the Peace of Augsburg, uh, where uh, literally he who rules a territory determines its religion. And because many of the electors that were at the head of the German states uh, had problems at that time with the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V, who was very much uh, working hand in hand with the Pope. Um, the, many of them decide to go for uh, Lutheranism. And so we see most of the Northern states becoming Lutherans, but for example, very large states of Bavaria will remain Catholic and is to this day. So here are just an idea. Uh, so here you have early Christianity uh, and some of the early uh, schisms that come from rites and often the nature of Christ. Uh, in the Orthodox, uh, we have different uh, schisms happening where, uh, as I say, they just uh, don't uh, believe that Christ is at the same level, for example, as the God the Father and the Holy Spirit. So there is, I'm not going to go into theology, but these are still what make uh, the Eastern Orthodoxy. And you have the Greek Orthodox, the Russian Orthodox, and a whole series of uh, difference, often because of question of power. As you can see, some of the Eastern rites came back uh, to join the, the Catholics later on. The red line shows the Western rites of the Catholic Church. And then we see here in the 16th century, uh, the Protestantism, the Anabaptism, and the Anglicanism. And let's see a more detail here of the Protestants. So we have Anglicanism from which come the Puritans and Separatists, 
as well as the Methodist in the uh, 18th century. From the Methodist will come the Adventist uh, that you see on that branch. The Lutherans stay pretty straight line, uh, though they will be a branch, uh, something branching off as the Pietism. Um, and then from Cal Calvinism <laughs> that you see here come the Presbyterians and the Reformed Church. And then we have Anabaptist, Anabaptists that finally are going to link a little bit with the Puritans and form the Baptist. And up here we have the Pentecostal, Pentecostalians. So here are just an idea for you to, to see uh, where all these movements uh, come. When I know when I moved to the US and I saw all these churches with different names, I couldn't believe it because Europe is much more um, straight line, either you're Catholic or you're Protestant, but not you don't have all these uh, little churches beside it. So anyway, uh, different points that made uh, the Reformation possible in the early part of the, set, the 16th century. Uh, the first thing is that descent between the electors and um, Charles V. So that uh, the electors decide to really go against him and accept things that were totally uh, foreign to Charles V and really going against his grain as being very Catholic. But also we remember in the 15th century, there was the invention of the printing press, particularly in Nuremberg early on. Uh, but the, both sides are going to use the printing press a lot. Uh, for propaganda. And this is a very easy meme uh, for people. Uh, these are cheap woodcuts most of the time. You can do a lot of them with just one woodcut. And um, they were cheap and they, so they could be uh, widespread in the whole country and other countries very easily. So this is one way that uh, Martin Luther's name is going to be become really famous. And in this um, woodcut by Hans Baldung Green, uh, it's part of a treatise that's called Acta and Res Geste uh, Martini Luteri, Dr. Martini Luteri. That was a, a treatise that was talking about uh, literally the life of Martin Luther. And you see how he's being described. Uh, there you see him with the uh, Holy Spirit hovering over him, so really giving him his inspiration. And he gestures towards the Bible, which for him becomes a central uh, mean uh, to apply, if you want, the faith uh, for, uh, for God. He believed that also uh, the clergy should not be the exclusive uh, way to grant salvation. He believed that human salvation depended on individual faith, not on clerical mediation. And as I mentioned, conceived that the Bible was the ultimate and sole source of Christian truth. He also advocated the abolition of uh, monasteries and criticized the church uh, way of use, using art. Uh, and we'll see some examples why uh, this is going completely overboard. Um, but because uh, Luther himself is not opposed to art, but he's opposed to the excesses. Uh, Luther was excommunicated in 1520, but then was granted the protection of the elector of Saxony, Frederick the Wise, and was given safe conduct to the imperial diet in Worms, and then an asylum in Wartburg. What was criticized in great part about images was something like you can see here by a little drawing by Hans Holbein, uh, the younger, uh, which is a marginal copy marginal uh, drawing in the copy of the praise of Fali by Erasmus of Rotterdam. And uh, there he makes that uh, little drawing showing 
a, a peasant coming by an image of St. Christopher carrying Christ uh, across the river. And what he really uh, mocks is not the saints, but he mocks those that worship them in a very superstitious way. Uh, so this is what he's against. He's against superstition. And we'll see that some uh, of these cults were absolutely uh, insane. But let's look also at the impact of uh, the Reformation. One very good example of what's going to happen with art, as you know, uh, there's going to be a big period of iconoclasm. But some of the art have survived. And uh, the angelic salutation by Weichstoss in the St. Lorenzkirche in Nuremberg uh, is a very good example. And I show you the site. Unfortunately, they're not very good pictures of St. Lawrence, but he is that extraordinary angelic salutation, very large uh, sculpture that hangs from the ceiling and uh, was commissioned by Anton II Tuscher in 1515. This is definitely one of the most beautiful examples of German Renaissance sculpture. Uh, this is very large and here is uh, a close up where you can see the angel announcing Mary, the fact she's going to become the mother of Christ. They are uh, hanging in the middle of um, a circle that is marked, it's just studded with roses and then um, little uh, clips of the life of uh, Mary and uh, Jesus. Uh, it used to be a huge golden crown, but that was taken at the time of uh, iconoclasm, the iconoclasm uh, period, and melted down. And then from that uh, beautiful circle hangs a rosary that would have uh, helped people praying in front of it to uh, make the prayers of uh, the Ave Maria. Now, normally that kind of work would have been destroyed during the icono iconoclastic uh, period. But because the Tuscher family was very prominent in Nuremberg, uh, people decided not to take it off, but instead to cover it. Because it wasn't the uh, property of the church, but property of the Tuscher family, they decided to just cover it, which was the case anyhow, because it would be only unveiled at certain uh, particular feast days in the year. So um, in 1525, uh, Anton Tuscher uh, converted to, to Lutheranism. And uh, so uh, this, the, the object of the, the angelic salutation lost its uh, religious uh, value, if you want. But uh, because it was, as I mentioned, the property of the Tuscher family, uh, they, it wasn't destroyed. And uh, it's only in the 19th century that the cover was taken down and it's now in a plain view when you go to visit the church. It's, it's absolutely extraordinary piece of art. I want to show you now an example of an image uh, that became really a center for idolatry and which was really uh, what Luther and many of the other um, reformers were totally opposed to. So just have to uh, give you a little idea is shortly after the death of the emperor Maximilian I in 1519, the city of Regensburg um, decided to expel the entire Jewish community, which was made of about 500 people who had settled there before um, or eras, or it was, they were there for a very long time. The city seized their house, their synagogue, and they started demolishing the whole thing. But during the demolition, a beam fell an injured uh, worker and his recovery was credited to the Virgin Mary. And so immediately the a church dedicated to her was to be built on that site. 
Nearby, a nearby monastery had a 13th century icon believed to have been painted by St. Luke. And it was borrowed from the monastery and was placed in the temporary wooden chapel that was erected in the middle of the rooms of the synagogue. So a whole uh, organization happened around that miracle of the cure of the, the worker. Uh, Aldorfer, who we talked about before, a very known painter then, who was also a member of the city council, designed tokens that were to be sold to the pilgrims coming to worship the image. And then at, he also designed four different prints of the beautiful virgin, the one of, uh, that you see here, showing that uh, representation of that uh, old icon. Uh, as you can see, the, the Virgin itself, the image of the Virgin is set in a beautiful Renaissance uh, frame. And it is accompanied with prayers that you see at the bottom that says, you are perfect, you, you are of perfect beauty, my love, and there is no blemish in you, hail Mary. There's also the, the coat of arm of Waldorfer and, um, and the coat of arm of the city and of a monogram of Waldorfer. Many miracles happened. They considered about 74 were documented in 1519 and 731 in 1522. By now, thousands of pilgrim, pilgrims were attracted uh, by th these miracles and came to Hagensburg, Hagensburg. And this, of course, when you have pilgrims that come, that brings a lot of money uh, with it. So they know that about 109,000, over 109,000 uh, tokens made of lead were sold to pilgrims and uh, almost 10,000 silver token were uh, sold. And these would be the proof that you have been there and it would be part of the indulgences process. Here is the uh, another image of the church, that famous temporary wooden church, uh, and the idea of the number of pilgrims that were coming there, most of them uh, in pretty good orders, just revolving around the chapel before uh, being able to get in. In front of the chapel is a statue of, uh, sculpted by uh, Erhard Heidenreich, uh, that was celebrating Mary and it was surrounded by a fence. As you can see, part of the crowd is not as ordinary as, and disciplined as uh, the others and have literally broken that protective fence and are there trying to touch uh, the image of Mary, thinking that it's going to bring them some uh, miracles. Uh, at the steeple of the the church is, hangs the banner made by Aldorfer of the Virgin uh, there. So this is exactly what uh, people just uh, didn't like, is that idea of uh, pilgrims and uh, that prostrate themselves, that uh, it becomes a, a business adventure because the city is pushing for it uh, by selling the tokens and of course all the money doesn't go for the good deeds, but most of the time ends up in the pockets of the church. Iconoclasm, as we'll see, uh, it's going to develop in some parts of Europe, goes back uh, quite a long time. And uh, as far as the iconoclasm in the Christian church, it is based uh, most of the time on the fourth commandment that says you shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above or that is on the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. And according to that fourth commandment, people uh, decided, many people decide they didn't want to see images. They could see symbolism, but not images of anything as uh, the four commandment says uh, that is in heaven above in the earth beneath or under the, uh, in the water under the, the earth with different idea though uh, we've seen iconoclasm happening every time you have a change of system 
So the uh, Christians destroyed a lot of the images of the Roman Empire's polytheistic religion uh, during the process of Christianization. Within the history of uh, Christianity, there's two big iconoclast movements in uh, the Eastern Church, so around um, Constantinople and in Greece uh, and Middle East, you have the first Byzantine iconoclasm uh, between 730 and 787, and then the second one uh, between 814 and 842. A good example is that church in Istanbul, uh, St. Irene, uh, where the uh, probably an image of Christ uh, in the, the, the vault above the, the apse uh, is being replaced by just the symbol of the cross. To talk about more iconoclasm, the French Revolution caused a tremendous amount of uh, damages to anything that had to do with religion between 1789 and 98, and others too. It's not only against the religion. And another example too is during and after the Russian Revolution, there was widespread de destruction of religious and secular imagery. Um, not too long ago, we saw in Afghanistan the big Buddha being uh, blown out by the Taliban. So this is an ongoing story. But as far as we're concerned, everything turns uh, around the fourth commandment. Uh, and the Catholic Church uh, often has used and decided uh, to use the images as an educational mean. It was for people that couldn't read uh, a way to understand the stories of the Old Testament or the New Testament or the, the different uh, moments of life of Christ and, and the Virgin and all the saints. So we, uh, unfortunately, we saw some bands of uh, mostly young people that started going around Europe. And this was not, by the way, due to Luther. Luther was not opposed to, uh, to images. Uh, his idea was that if we can have Christ in our heart, we can also have Christ in our eyes. But he was opposed to the excess of idolatry. It is... Um, an associate of his, uh, mostly uh, Karstadt, who was opposed to images. And while uh, Calvin was away and actually protected by the elector, that he took advantage of that time to really make sermons that would um, promote the idea of destruction of images and then uh, inspire some uh, groups of uh, people to go around the Northern uh, Europe. And so we have different uh, moments where uh, the followers of Karlstadt, also Zwingli and Calvin didn't like images either. Uh, this is an example that still remains on site in situ in the Cathedral of St. Martin in Utrecht in the Netherlands, in the southern part of Netherlands. And uh, the extraordinary uh, Cathedral of St. Martin uh, has that. This was a, a low relief uh, as part of an uh, altarpiece that shows uh, the, uh, the holy kinship, the, the, the family, the holy family. And you can see it has com completely been defaced. There were uh, other iconoclastic riots took place in Zurich in 1523, in Copenhagen in 1530, in Geneva 1535, in Scotland in 1559, uh, and uh, in Belgium particularly uh, in 1566. Here are some images showing the uh, iconoclastic uh, riot in Zurich in 1524, and you can see they take away, they take down the sculptures uh, and paintings and then uh, make it a bonfire outside the church. Uh, in the Netherlands, for example, they mostly, they're going to um, whitewash paintings 
uh, or uh, frescoes that were on the wall, they're going to demolish the uh, stained glass windows and replace them with clear windows. And uh, often they're going to take, if people didn't have a chance to first save them, they're going to take sculptures and uh, burn them. Uh, in France, the first uh, riot uh, took place in uh, La Rochelle, and it shows he still shows uh, the remains of the Calvinist iconoclast, where you see these sculptures were completely uh, broken. In the Netherlands, as I mentioned, in uh, the sorry, in 1566. Uh, what happens, what is called the build storm, the, the, uh, it means the, the storm, it's, it's the storm against the, the images. And we have here a view of the superb cathedral of Antwerp. Uh, at that time, uh, not yet, the, the second tower has not been built yet. It had the cathedral had been ravaged by a fire and that had stopped the construction of the second tower, which has been built since. So when uh, the, the parishioners were in the middle of a big uh, feast when the um, uh, rioters came about and they didn't have the time nor the reaction to prevent them to damage the cathedral. The cathedral owned about um, 40 and some, get, uh, 40 and some uh, altarpieces with all the different chapels. This is a very, very large church. And of all of them, only four remained. And you see one uh, on the side by Franz Floris, the fold of rebel angels, though the two wings of that altarpiece uh, were destroyed. So it was absolutely horrible. The whole interior of the cathedral was damaged. Uh, and the population got absolutely outraged. Though uh, Antwerp was uh, ruled by Protestants for a couple of years before, uh, 16, before 1585, and then turned back to Catholicism. But uh, this was an episode that, was, uh, that really marked the city. Fortunately, other cities knowing that the, the, these writers were on their way, formed the militia to prevent them to come in. And this is the case of Bruges, for example, which was uh, saved uh, from these terrible damages. And here's another image uh, showing the iconoclast in Antwerp in 1566, where they, as you can see, uh, break the stained glass windows, they take down the um, statues, but they also, as you can see, go, you can see the guy coming out with a large bag on his shoulder um, shows that uh, that man has been uh, looting some stores uh, nearby. So I'm going to show you a, a painter that we've talked about, but we haven't uh, really seen up to now, that is a very good example of transition from pre-Reformation to Reformation. And he became very highly involved in the whole process as he befriended uh, Martin Luther later on. And I'm talking about Lucas Cranach, Cranach the, the Elder, who lived between 1472 and that's, sorry, in 1553, uh, he was born at Kronach in Upper Franconia, and this is where he takes his name. Uh, he learned the art of drawing from his father, Hans Mahler, and Mahler in German means painter, so he must have uh, been known as a painter. We know very little about his early life, <laughs> but we know that in 1504, he came to live in Wittenberg and stayed there until 1520. And he worked for Frederick the Wise, who was the elector of Saxony, will work uh, for his brother once Frederick the Wise dies. In 1509, he went to the Netherlands, met uh, the emperor Maximilian and painted uh, his portrait as well as the one of his son, the future Emperor Charles V. In fifth, the first uh, element that we have of the 
the relationship between Luther and Cranach uh, is in a document in 1520 where we know that uh, they've been friends for already a little while. Uh, so we date 1520. We sure that by that time he knew Luther. And then he will die in Weimar in 1553. He will never really leave the German states uh, after his trip to the Netherlands. Kanak was happily married and had two sons, both artists. Hans Kanak, whose life is, is I say obscure, we don't know much, died in Bologna in 1537. And Lukas Kanak, the younger, was born in 1515 and who died in 1586. Uh, who became a painter of uh, good renown. Uh, he also had three daughters. One of them was Barbara Kanak, who died in 1569, and had married Christian, Christian Bruck, Bruck uh, known with his Latin name of Pontanus, and was an ancestor of Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. And I wanted to mention that because the world is so small. I love to, to see these things. So let's look at some of the works of uh, Kanak. Kanak is a very diverse painter. So I have, uh, I'm going to offer uh, the images categorized because I think it's going to be a better way of understanding his work. So in 1506, he received the commission um, from the elector of Saxony for a triptych with the martyrdom of St. Catherine. Uh, and then we can see uh, Catherine uh, kneeling there, awaiting her martyrdom. And in fact, at that time, we see the lightning uh, is demolishing the wheel on which she was going to be stretched. Uh, and this is the first part of, um, of her, the miracles that are dedicated to her. Uh, what is interesting is that uh, Kranach is from that time on, every time he receives a um, commission from his new patron, uh, is going to include them in the paintings. And the, among the two knights that we see at the back here are actually Frederick the Wise and his brother, John the Steadfast. Uh, Interesting work, as you can see, uh, it, it's a rather dark moment. We see hail falling from the sky, the terrible sky at the back. And then uh, around it, uh, we have a series of uh, saints, uh, St. Agnes and others uh, that are protecting, of course, uh, are probably linked to as patron saint to the two men. This is another uh, interesting uh, painting, the triptych with the holy kinship. This was a subject that was quite privileged in the 16th century, showing the holy family. And we have in the central panel, the lovely view of Mary playing with uh, baby Jesus, which is on the lap of St. Anne. And then uh, being in the back asleep is of course, St. Joseph. Other children are playing around, and of course, there's always a little pooch, uh, very comfortable there. What is quite interesting there is that together uh, with the uh, that very intimate uh, moment, we have two almost uh, life-size portraits of the two electors. So Frederick the Wise on one side, and John the Steadfast on the other that are integrated in the story. Among the legends of the, the family of Christ uh, comes the idea that Anne was married three times. The first time with Joachim, with whom she had the virgin. But uh, after that, she got married with Cleophas and then Salomas. And each time had a daughter that was also named Mary. And so this is why you, we, you often hear about Mary Cleophas and Mary Salomas, uh, Mar or Mary Salome sometimes, uh, that are with uh, the Virgin at the time of the crucifixion. Uh, these come from there. 
And at the back here are supposed to be the two husbands of uh, St. Anne. And the central figure is in fact, has the feature of the Emperor Maximilian. So very interesting how they uh, superimpose the identity of uh, Cleophas and Salomas uh, with contemporary figures. This also uh, suggests the loyalty of the Saxon towards the imperial court, uh, a lot of underlying meaning. On, when you close that triptych, the, outside, the outer wings uh, show uh, the, and sorry, it's not the Annunciation, but shows Mary with uh, Christ and St. Anne on the other side, and give you an idea of what will happen when you open the wings that you're going to have a view of the Holy Kinship. The Holy Kinship was a self-portrait. This is a small, uh, painting that was actually painted by Cranach um, as a um, token to the anniversary of his uh, marriage with his beloved wife. And for that reason, he includes himself. And you have here a uh, standing on the side, uh, Cranach, who is portrays himself as Alpheus, who, or Cleophas, uh, that is the same, uh, that is the a last husband to Anna that is sitting down with Christ there. And he is actually the self-portrait of um, Hanach at the time. But an interesting uh, view of uh, what would be a domestic life. I also want to bring in uh, a symbol that you see down here, which is going to become from that time on uh, the signature of Cranach. And I have a blow up of this that shows you that it is actually a winged snake with a ruby ring in his mouth. And when you see that sign, it's a uh, Cranach the Elder. From that time on too, he's going to uh, follow a new iconography and follow uh, the uh, rule by Luther. As I said, uh, Luther was not opposed to images and he had said himself, it's not a sin, but good to have the image of Christ in my heart. Why should it be a sin to have it in my eyes? It is especially true since the heart is more important than the eyes. The uh, emphasis will be the life of Christ, the acts of the apostles, and then the sacraments of baptism and the Eucharist, which are some of the most important uh, sacraments for Lutheranism. There will be no representation of the Virgin, uh, most, mostly no saints, and sometimes uh, some local saints do appear, and no devotion such to rosary. So here is in the Schneeberg uh, altarpiece, the first retable known to have been created for an evangelical church. Uh, it was installed in the church of St. Wolfgang in Schneeberg. Uh, that was a very prosperous silver mining town uh, in the Ore Mountains in southern Saxony. And uh, this gives you a, a really good focal point for the liturgical rituals of local Lutherans for nearly a hundred years. Um, this painting, by the way, so you have an idea of its history, uh, was uh, stolen by the imperial troops in 1633 at the height of the 30 year war. Uh, during that part, it was dismantled and then later partly reinstalled uh, in a Baroque environment. And it's, it is now uh, reconstructed with a modern frame. The, all the iconography that you see, the story that are told correspond to or are derived from Luther's sermons and other writings. Uh, it explains uh, Luther's notion of justification by grace through faith and uh, really gives you a new foundation for the pictorial uh, interpretation of traditional subjects. 
So just for example, if you look at the predella, the, the painting uh, below that shows the Last Supper is very interesting because it shows Christ, but also a whole series of the known uh, reformers of the time. So literally portraits of uh, Luther and other of his uh, followers are included within. Now let's uh, focus at the central part of the painting. As you can see, it's a common uh, landscape line. And so it should follow. So what you see here is the devil pushing every man into the fire. Uh, Christ is there and trying to, to show that uh, through faith he could be saved. Uh, but it looks like it's not it's not a work to see uh, Adam and Eve uh, in just the, below the, the tree uh, with the apples in the Garden of Eden. And Moses is there with the uh, table of laws under his arm. The tree that is made makes the middle of the image, as you can see, is dead on one side and alive on the other. And that should tell you the whole story. So it is not the clerics who are going to uh, intervene to give you uh, grace and, and uh, salvation, but rather when you look at the image of Christ's suffering, uh, and here you have also the image of uh, the lamb, sacrificial lamb, this is what is going to be your way to salvation, is to through faith and understanding of Christ. In the back here, you can see an encampment of the, the old uh, Jewish people there. And next to the Christ crucified, you have the image of Christ coming out of uh, the, the tomb at his resurrection and killing the devil. And then all kind of positive image behind. So this is really that contrast between the fact that uh, in the former uh, religion, if you want, through the Catholics, you had to go through clerics to get your salvation, whereas you can get it directly just looking at Christ and believing in his uh, power of salvation. You have two uh, views of the same um, triptych. So this is the second opening when you open the central uh, part, uh, part of the altarpiece. Uh, this comes up and what you have is of course the, the large view of the crucifixion uh, with very pale complexion of uh, Jesus hanging at the cross, uh, a crowd of people surrounding it. But striking are the two images again of Frederick the Wise and John the Steadfast that are there as donors. Uh, and then a view of uh, Christ's transfiguration and Christ's resurrection on the other side. So a great uh, um, emphasis on Christ and his sacrifice and the passion. Another of these um, triptychs, what you call the Reformation altarpiece, uh, is in that uh, church in Wittenberg, so where uh, Luther was, and is really interesting because it cho chose the Last Supper, which of course stands for the Eucharist, and where you see Christ and John uh, there. You also, if you go around, find suddenly a series of the Lutheran um, reformers, including Calvin. So the integration of these figureheads uh, among the, uh, the apostles uh, is very telling, I think. On the left, you have uh, another disciple, disciple of L uh, Luther, Melanchthon, uh, who is administering uh, baptism to that baby. And then on the right, you have the uh, penance uh, that is actually administered by another, um, sorry, 
the pens by Johannes Bugenhagen, who is also uh, one of the, the friends of, um, of Luther. At the bottom in the predella, uh, we have a view of Christ on the cross, the believers there, and then uh, Martin Luther preaching. This, by the way, was done a year after Luther's death. Another high altar, this is showing the closed position. So as you can see, these are hinged, then you can open as very often you have the view, the, the sight of uh, the Annunciation, the angel uh, Gabriel and the Virgin uh, on both sides, uh, St. Ursula and St. Erasmus. And at the bottom, you have the Virgin and Child surrounded by the 14 helpers. And of course, the 14 helpers uh, were a group of saints that were venerated uh, mostly in Germany uh, that were actually made of uh, uh, at the center of uh, St. Barbara and St. Margarita and St. Catherine, and then surrounded by a whole series of other saints that were all helping uh, people to, uh, to live a proper life. So when you open these central panels, oh, sorry, that shouldn't be there. Yes, you have a view of the Virgin and Child. So you're gonna tell me, we don't see the Virgin anymore. Uh, this is in 1540, it probably had a different um, patron that uh, believed in uh, the Virgin. So uh, he is going to do it, as you can imagine, uh, for the money, in a sense. Uh, on the left, you find the very interesting saint and one of the only colored men in the, the panoply oh. of saints um, is St. Mauritius. And then on the right, uh, St. Alexander. The Virgin is surrounded by uh, clouds and uh, cherubs. Another word that is quite interesting by Kanach is that law and the gospel. Uh, the whole idea of law, and it's a very complicated um, idea, is that the law that we inherited from the Jews, should it be modified uh, with the way life is now? And so there, there, there's three steps in the law, uh, <laughs> education and uh, the order uh, also, and then the face. So we have, again, it's repetitive to what we've seen before. We have uh, the devils uh, that are pushing every man to uh, hell. In the back, we have the sinners, of course, Adam and Eve, and then a representation of the Jewish encampments uh, in the back. And then this is a contrast with every man uh, standing and being shown the image of Christ on the cross. And the fact that it is through the faith and the understanding of the sacrifice of Christ that you can be saved and go to heaven. As you can see, the images are not central or not extraordinarily pretty, but rather rigid. And it's, it's uh -huh. very much a mark of these um, reformed uh, altarpieces. Kanach is also quite an adept of engravings. Again, it's practical because uh, it's not uh, expensive. It can be sold in multiple exemplars, exemplars and white and spread around uh, Europe. So here is another image of Martin Luther. This is before he left the uh, the orders, he's still shown here as an Augustinian uh, monk. And it's one of the most memorable images of uh, Luther. Kanak is going to paint quite a series of uh, portraits of uh, Luther. As, uh, we know he's, uh, he was very close to Kanak. Kanak actually became the godfather 
of one of the children of Luther. So here are just a few portraits. This is Martin Luther as an Augustinian monk with a doctoral hat. Mm -hmm. uh, in the center, uh, we have, oh, hold on a second. I have to make sure that everybody is muted. Um, in the center, we have a portrait of Martin Luther is Junker Jörg. Uh, that particular image shows the time where he was under the protection of the elector, uh, Frederick the Wise, who protected him, but in a disguise where he uh, came about uh, as the writer Junker Jörg. And for a little while, uh, Luther was protected against the vindictive Pope uh, in his facility and uh, wrote a lot uh, during that time. And the third one is a portrait of just Martin Luther. He's left the, the orders and uh, is actually in the point, on the point of being married. This most probably was uh, uh, coupled with a painting of his wife that uh, as is very often shown. And uh, actually, Kanak made a whole series of these diptych of Martin Luther and his wife, Katharina von Boha, who was actually a former nun. And uh, they got married in 1525, but that was controversial. And to try to set uh, the mind of people at ease, uh, and make it a kind of a propaganda. Kanak had to paint a whole series of these diptych to be sent around and uh, to show, uh, to try to legitimize the fact that that former monk and that former nun got married and actually had children. This portrait of a young girl is believed to be the portrait of one of the children of uh, Luther. It's a delightful uh, portrait of that young girl with cascading blonde hair on her black uh, coat. Uh, there is some disagreement that she is or she is not, but anyhow, she's uh, very pretty. Uh, Kanach is also going to illustrate uh, the New Testament that had been uh, translated into German by Luther. And this is a view of the seven candle candelabras in the uh, apocalypse. Kanach will do lots of uh, portraits and of course, uh, as you can believe, uh, many of his uh, patrons, the elector Frederick the Wise in his old age, and uh, on the other hand, uh, his uh, brother, the elector John the Steadfast of Saxony, who will succeed him when he uh, dies. And this is a very accurate portrait of him because we have other uh, portraits by Dürer of the same and they're uh, very identical. At that time, portraits very, were very often uh, used for, uh, were exchanged. So between rulers, they would exchange their portraits so people would know. Now you might find funny to have a um, wreath of carnation on the head of that strong man, but this was a habit. Uh, this is probably correspond to the time where his daughter got married and uh, typically, the father of the bride had to wear uh, one of these wreaths during the celebrations. Now, um, Kanak is going to do different portraits beside the official ones, uh, but he's going to develop his very own aesthetic. And uh, he's, this is typical of what him and his workshop are going to produce as a generalized portrait of a woman. And on these good words, I'm going to give you a little time now to uh, stretch your legs, get a cup of coffee or a glass of water and ask me questions if you want. So just Beautiful. open up for five minutes and see if you have any questions. 
Yes, Anne. You have to unmute yourself, Anne. Yes. The clarity of of Cranach's painting is what is 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 he? It says oil and tempera on red beech wood, but is that technique? What's what's giving it this? First of all, it's good reproduction. Incredible. <laughs> <laughs> it's good reproductions, but uh, yes, he's uh, because you have that contrast on the dark background. Mm -hmm. uh, his portraits pop up really beautifully. It's not always the case, but he has that very blue, very nice bluish white, as you can see at the sleeves. Mm -hmm. uh, it, as we'll see, we'll contrast him with um, Dürer, who is, you know, Dürer is going to die in the early 1520s. And so uh, he's a contemporary up to a point, but he is going to ways do her, as you know, is very theoretical, goes to Italy, comes back with the theories of perspective and of and the, the perfection of anatomy and so on. Uh, Kanak disregards that. And we'll see in his uh, paintings, we'll see the series now on mythological or allegorical view. He doesn't care, he elongates the forms and he, he gets his very own uh, models. And this is one of a good example. This one and the one we'll see afterwards become stereotypical of Kanak, where you feel that he's, these are his inventions, they're not particularly portraits or close to. But they're very crisp, I agree. Uh, they, Probably he used very good technique and these portraits have been kept in good condition. That's the only thing I can imagine. Um, it's always different when you have a portrait or when you have a um, altarpiece because altarpiece, don't forget, is going to be subject to torches and candles and so on. So it's going to be in an environment where it's difficult to keep them clean. It looks porcelain-like. It absolutely does. I agree with you. And they, his feminine figures are very doll-like. <laughs> they, they, they're really cute. You can recognize a Kanak right away. Uh, so it's interesting. He's an interesting person because he's very versatile. As you've seen, he goes very deep into the Reformation because he's a friend of Luther. But then he's going to do that other uh, altarpiece that is 1540, so it's long after uh, the, re the beginning of the Reformation, and he's going to show the Virgin Mary. We have to realize that for artists, the Reformation was horrible because suddenly the patron, the biggest patron they had, which was the church, suddenly disappears. Uh, they cannot do any of these religious painting that they were paid lots of money for. So they have to reinvent themselves. And it, it was a tough, tough time. So we, we're going to see some other examples. Any other questions? Yes, Anne, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, I don't know who I'm talking to. It's though. me, it's me uh, Nikki Tovin from Chicago. Okay, Nikki, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, um, one of the center uh, altarpieces was the crucifixion. Yes. I'm sure we have that painting at the Art Institute. So how can that be? Mm -hmm. uh, let me... It was the center portion, I think. Oh, I know, I have... I'm looking at it here to see where it is. No, because that one is in, is in the church. Uh, no, but they are, you know. Would he have painted two of the exact same? Because it, it looks almost exact to me. He did a lot of copies, but not that I know of for that one. Yeah, well, I'm sure it's not a copy at the Art Institute. No, of course. <laughs> no, and, and Although you don't know. <laughs> always true. Because yes. it can be, if it's a copy by his hand or his workshop, it can end up there and be significant. Yeah. So it might be there. Uh, but this is really made for that very church. And as we discussed, mm -hmm. it was the first reform um, work that he did. And so it's very unique. Uh, but 
it would be interesting to look at. I have a catalog somewhere of the Art Institute. Uh, if you can okay, I'd, confirm it, I would be quite interested. Yes, I, I'm going to try to check it out and see if okay, I can. Okay, do that for me and then let me know. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, no other questions, so we're going to go on. I have a question, just a quick one. Yes, Jen. Uh, Calvin and Luther, were they at all, were their uh, ideas at all related? No, they, the, the only things they have in common is to go against the Pope and the Catholic Church. Uh, and not everything in the Catholic Church, of course. But no, their ideas... You know, there had been a lot of things brewing with excesses in the church. And so there were many people that were miscontent. And, uh, but uh, Luther is mm -hmm. original in his, his way, though, as I've mentioned at the beginning, he's inspired by things that happened before him, the Jan Hus or Wycliffe. Uh, Calvin comes from a very different thing. He's very French in his way of thinking. But many of them are opposed to the power of the Pope, that's very much, and to the excess of the cult of Mary, the excess of uh, the clerics. Many of them, uh, priests, were absolutely uneducated and unable to really uh, hold their, their job properly, if you want. And, um, and then you also had the idea of the, uh, what is called the transubstantiation, which is the idea in the Eucharist that uh, at the time of the consecration, the host becomes the body of Christ and um, the, the wine becomes the blood of Christ. And transubstantiation was very, um, very much opposed uh, by most of them, but they came with their very own interpretation. So what Luther says about it is not what Calvin says, uh, nor Swingley. So, so, so people that believed in Luther became Lutherans and people that believed in Calvin became Calvinists? Calvinist. But Calvinists turned into Presbyterians and, and so on. So. Uh, that's why I gave you at the beginning, you have these graphs that give you an idea where it comes, you know, where everything comes from. Uh, so, no, so they... Lutherans, Lutherans, ended, Lutherans ended up more in Germany and Calvinists ended up Lutheran, more... Definitely, uh, almost uniquely in Germany. And of course, coming with the German to the US later on. Um, but Calvin is... Uh, comes from France, but has to flee to, to Switzerland. And uh, it is in the Netherlands, for example, it's Calvinism and mostly it is gonna happen. In England, on the other hand, you have the Church of England. And at first, and we'll talk about it in a minute, but it, at first they try to make it the only religion in England, but that's not gonna work. <laughs> so you will have the Puritans and so on and so the Church of England is one among many in England too. Thank you. So, and uh, the Lutherans, by the way, also go, uh, is the religion, the state religion in uh, Denmark and the, the most um, accepted religion in most of the Scandinavian country. So let's go on with Cranach and I'm gonna mute you again and we'll talk at the end. So beside that uh, lovely general, generalized portrait of a woman, he is one of my favorite of his portrait, is a portrait of a woman um, that is going to become very typical of his uh, women portrait or his uh, bi biblical figures, for example, we'll find that kind of eyes. It's, you know, you look at her eyes, very slanted eyes. They almost remind me of Giotto. Uh, to, to have these very slanted eyes and uh, but beautiful features, lovely costume. What is inspired by the uh, Flemish painters, you have that uh, open window to a landscape. 
And it could very well be that this was a double portrait and would be the uh, groom or husband ag across uh, on the other side. Now the uh, portraits of men are quite formidable. Uh, I just admire their, their setting. And so here is, for example, the portrait of a man with a gold embroidered cap uh, that uh, is supposed to be Lukas Spielhausen. He was a state lawyer uh, in the state judicial curia uh, in Saxony there. And uh, so just a, a formidable mustache and beard, uh, very typical of the German state of the time. But he wears, in contrast, a costume that is very much inspired by Italian, the Italian fashion. Kanak is also going to make uh, some satirical uh, prints. Again, these were uh, propaganda works that would be sold around and uh, criticize papacy and the uh, Catholic uh, religion. So here you have uh, in that Christ expelling the money changers and on the other side, the Pope selling bulls and uh, indulgences. Uh, the contrast between what they called Christ and Antichrist. Uh, here you have, of course, uh, Christ that uh, in the New Testament is shown to expel the merchants from the, the temple. And then on the other side, you have the view of people bringing money to get indulgences. Um, the bulls were not really sold, but uh, maybe at that time. So uh, this is the direct criticism uh, showing what should be and what shouldn't be. The texts were provided by Philip Melanchthon, who was uh, a disciple of, uh, of um, Luther, Luther. Another one, a little more funny, is uh, part of what they call Papspot Builder. Papspot Builder. Um, and these were close to, to scatological, uh, where you have the little legend on top saying, don't frighten a Pope with your ban, and don't be such a furious man. And you can see the Pope and some flames coming out of his text. Otherwise, we shall turn around and show you our rears. And uh, there's not only the rear, but the gas coming out of them. So these were these uh, semi uh, funny type of images, but again, were uh, part of the propaganda against the church. Again, uh, in the large, on a larger scale, here is uh, what you can again see that the visual antithesis to compare Lutheran and uh, Catholic faith. So uh, separated by that column in the, in the middle, you have on either side um, preacher who are preaching, addressing their, their audiences. And the one on the left uh, is recognized right away as Luther who had died many years before and who shows a direct line through the sacrifice sacrificial lamb and the Holy Spirit who is hovering over him uh, to Christ and God the Father. Uh, you have the image, of course, of Christ on the cross, the passion of Christ, and different important figures and some, are, uh, some portraits. Here is Frederick the Wise carrying the cross uh, himself. So the biblical interpretation comes directly from God through Christ the Lamb of God and uh, the scripture. So this is really the tenets of um, Luther. Now on the other side, uh, you have uh, God that drains fire and stones, though uh, St. Francis is really trying to intercede for people there. Uh, you have the church at the Hagensburg with the pilgrims, uh, and you have a preacher in the, the pulpit there that is inspired by the devil who puts ideas in his ears. And as you can see, the monk is very corpulent too. Among the clergy below, uh, one wears a full cap. I'm trying to see which one. Uh, 
I don't see it right now, but there's one with a full cap. Uh, and another has cards and dice spilling from his call. Oh, here it is. So you can see that they uh, call themselves monks, but in fact, they, they're playing uh, and probably um, playing for money. The Pope sits at a table here covered uh, with money bags and indulgences. And the document he holds says, whilst the, count, the coin still rings, the soul to heaven springs. And of course, uh, this is a parody of that whole idea of the, of the indulgences. So very negative view of the Catholic faith, very beautiful view of Luther's ideas. Kanak was not the only one who did uh, these type of things. So in this, at the same time, you have another uh, German artist, Melchior Lorch, that makes that satire on papacy that is a much more refined view. You see the Pope here with three faces, three heads. Uh, one in the middle is, bears the papal ti uh, tiara, the one at the left a turban, while the one at the right is represent as that of an infant. Um, so this gives you an idea of the demonic side of the Pope. There is a tail coming out and one of the, the feet is in fact uh, an animal uh, feet. Uh, and he is, as you can see, one of his hand has these claws and he's giving money to that soldier on the other side. Uh, and that shows that um, bribery of the church for the benefit of military protection. Now, beside these type of images, uh, Kanak is going to make a whole array of subjects, including biblical, and there comes the famous Adam and Eve that he made a whole series of at least 20 different ones. I picked this one, it's really beautiful. But to show the difference between the famous Adam and Eve of Dürer on the right, that was painted in 1507, and that where Dürer is really showing the respect for the anatomy and the, the perfect proportions. Whereas uh, Kanak has distanced himself from that and makes now elongated uh, images. As you can see, the legs are huge uh, and he doesn't care about the exactitude of what he's making, but it's a very charming image of um, Adam and Eve in this case. The Feast of Herod, he also represented many times uh, Salome. And here we have the scene where uh, Herodia has just received the head of uh, John the Baptist and is uh, bringing it to Herod. As you can see, that the very uh, slimy face of, of Herodia there to be called Salome later on. And, um, Herod doesn't want to have anything to do with the, the, the head. And then behind you have again, everybody is dressed in the German fashion. Here comes back the face of the young woman that we saw before. This is Judith with the head, Judith with the head of Holofernes. We have seen many times that uh, heroin in, in Italy, particularly, uh, as you know, she comes from the a book of Judas, where the, the young widow decides to try to save her city uh, that is besieged by the Assyrian. And she goes out, puts her best dress and jewelry to try to uh, convince the general Holofernes, who is on the other side, to abandon the siege. But for that, she makes a line, pretends that they're going to surrender anyhow. The, he's so charmed by her, he drinks too much, and she takes advantage of the time he falls asleep and drunk to, to cut his head. And this is the moment where we see a very uh, self-assured Judith um, and uh, always dressed with the, the prettiest uh, clothing and feathered hats. 
uh, on her head. Other figure of uh, the, the Bible, Samson and Delilah, directly inspired from a woodcut by uh, Lucas van Leiden, that you can see here on the right. Uh, he, Samson is fallen asleep on the laps of the woman he loves, and she takes advantage of that to uh, cut his hair so he loses his strength and the soldiers are ready to uh, make him prisoner. And again, it's in these uh, paintings, I'm trying to find it. Uh, at the bottom, there is that, that famous uh, winged serpent with uh, the, the uh, ruby ring. David and Bathsheba, King David is up there, as you can see with his Lyra. Uh, he falls in love with the beautiful Bathsheba when uh, she's uh, bathing and uh, had her brought to him for a lover's tryst. Soon afterwards, he sends her husband uh, to his death. And of course, um, God is going to punish the couple by, uh, with the death of their first son. But this is all set in a, in a very beautiful landscape and, and lush trees. Now, some allegorical scene that he did are absolutely hilarious. Uh, this is probably my favorite. It shows the fountain of views. Uh, and this is, of course, that. Uh, yearning of humanity for immortality and eternal use. So we all guilty of that. So the uh, human beings dream of being young again and uh, leaving the worn outer shell and exchanging it for a new one. And so you see a whole series of people, uh, mostly women, by the way, brought by, with carriages, brought on stretchers, uh, with the husbands behind, as you can see. Uh, even really old hacks, and then they go into the fountain in the very middle, of course, uh, you have the fountain uh, with Venus, and then they go through that pond and come on the other side and they rejuvenated, they're beautiful, they invited into the tent where they're going to get beautiful uh, clothing, and then they can flirt and, and make jolly uh, for the rest of their life. And I find it so, it, isn't it still up to date? I think so. So, so actual. Another in the allegorical category is uh, of its inspired by of its uh, metamorphosis is the golden age, and the golden age uh, here is the text uh, of its text. The golden age was first when man yet knew no rule but uncorrupted reason knew, and with a native bent did good pursue, enforced by punishment, unawed by fear. His words were simple and his soul sincere. Needless was written law where known oppressed. The law of man was written in his breast. Uh, and so it's really interesting. He painted two of these. Uh, and in this one, you have different objects. First of all, we have to see it's surrounded, which means that outside of that uh, wall is just another world where it is not the golden age where you have hierarchy and you have injustice and so on. But within this, uh, you have a whole series of people, all in the nude, because nudity goes there. People are vegetarian. They don't eat animals. Animals are vegetarian too, even the lion, as you can see. Um, the men and women are differentiated by their flesh tone. You see that uh, women are light skin, a uh, light colored skin, and men are more tan because they spend more time outside. Uh, and 
so you you have the time of perfect harmony, prosperity, and nudism. There is definitely a parallel with uh, the Garden of Eden. Um, even here, agriculture is superflu superfluous as the, the earth provided food for everyone in, aban in abundance. So in order to keep peace and harmony, humans follow their moral instinct rather than a written law. This became a very uh, favorite subject in the 16th century. Uh, the people that you see dancing around uh, the tree is actually the pagan fertility ritual. The tree standing for uh, masculinity. And then it's interesting is the only one that are really where you have a real sexual approach in the two that are in the pond where the woman is obviously showing herself off to the man who is desperately trying to come and grab her. Uh, he did also many paintings on mythological subject. Uh, this is the Judgment of Paris that is at the Metropolitan. I think it's not too long that they acquired it. And it's very interesting to see the three goddesses, uh, typical Kanach, a representation, but with Hermes dressed in, in a very uh, interesting way. And then you have, um, sorry, um, what's his name again? Paris, who is kind of in a dream in front of Juno, Venus, and Minerva, Minerva with his um, horse behind. And then you have Cupid. Uh, using his uh, bow to send his famous arrow of love. Sorry. Uh, Apollo and Diana, uh, this is a subject that uh, he's going to treat many times too. As you can see, Apollo is about to shoot an arrow while Diana is sitting on a deer. I love the way she holds her leg. Uh, Lucretia, this is one of many, all these subjects have been new, have been painted multiple times by Kana. Uh, this is one of the earliest known treatment of that uh, subject by uh, Lucas. And this is really an embodiment of virtue. Uh, as you know, she had been uh, raped and she did it for the sake of his, her family and then decides to uh, kill herself. Talk about porcelain. This is uh, Cupid complaining to Venus. Uh, as you can see, he's there, he's surrounded by bees. Um, and then you have Venus is there holding the branch of uh, that apple tree in a very uh, porcelain-like uh, flesh tone. So this must have been very pleasing to the German, that kind of uh, anatomy. He also made some paintings for the, the elector, uh, multiple paintings of a hunt uh, in front of one of his castles. This is the Hartenfels castle. And it shows a, a very uh, busy, busy hunt with courtiers around too. So it's really interesting to see uh, these three women uh, with the one man standing in the barge in a very uh, difficult river to navigate. Uh, but then you, you see all the animals. You have bears around here that has obviously uh, killed or maimed somebody there. And uh, now the, all the, the dogs are entering the, the field attacking the bear. There's another bear up here in the tree with the horses and the bays. On the other side, you have boars. 
uh, and uh, another kind of hunt. And then here it's mostly deers uh, attacked uh, by the horses. So very lively uh, painting that you can imagine. Again, these were conversation pieces. Uh, this is very much the premises to the 17th century equivalent where people would uh, be standing in front of that and commenting on the different, you know, little uh, stories happening around the painting. Beside uh, Kanak, we come here to the end of Kanak, there were other artists, but often the, by far not as prolific as uh, Kanak was. Uh, he is a work very typical of the Reformation, showing uh, Peter Dell's allegory of faith, very didactic character, uh, no sensuality at all. It's a rather rigid image. Um, you have an attractive young uh, woman who is steering a ship uh, that is uh, with a rudder that is inscribed the Christian life. The ship of life is made of flesh and blood. Its sail in rigging our love and patience. Its shield is faith and its compass is the word of God. This pilgrimage of life takes her from the earthly city in flame in the upper left to the Christ on the opposite side. A different interpretation by Zebal Beham. Zebal Beham is an interesting figure. He does a lot of, uh, uh, he's mostly an, an engraver and uh, makes these works, uh, made a lot of peasant views also, but some religious didactic uh, works like this one of Adam and Eve and the tree there is replaced by a skeleton. Uh, though the snake is still there and uh, Eve is giving the apple to Adam. He's considered a little master. This is another of his work, uh, prodigal, prodigal Son. And these were didactic uh, work where you see one episode of the life of the prodigal son, where he is a uh, herder and uh, before he's going to lose everything. Now, in the north, uh, in um, Germany, many of the painters, this is a Flemish painter, was called to redecorate the, the Schlosskapelle, the uh, chapel of the, the, the castle uh, in cell. And so the, uh, the whole program that you see here, which is a rather, again, didact didactic uh, program, it, it has no structure, if you want. Uh, is going to, uh, Martin de Vos and others are going to repaint all these images with uh, the idea of the Reformation. So moving away from uh, multiple saints that uh, don't make sense in the eyes of uh, the reformers. Now we have to realize, as I was mentioning before, that the Reformation is going to be a, a drastic event, a, a tragic event for many uh, painters because the biggest customer was the church and suddenly for those that are in these countries uh, they completely have to to change their um, portfolio if you want and so uh, it's going to be difficult and the also uh, the icon iconoclastic rights is going to punish an enormous amount of um, of works. So we see, for example, a painter like Artson, and we have already shown these images. Peter Artson um, made an enormous amount of religious paintings and of which almost none survive. And so he really had to move to what is going to become uh, the still lives, though it's a, a mix between domestic uh, genre paintings and still life. And he's going to become a master, him and his nephew, the Burkhardt, are really the origin of uh, 
domestic and uh, life and and um, still lives. And so, as you can see, that the quite entertaining paintings of the egg dance, you see a family there, a, a whole series with around a table where you can see some cheeses and different uh, dishes. Uh, but they are now surrounding that young man who is doing that uh, dance, whereas with one foot he has to move without breaking it, uh, the egg into the circle that is next to it. Often his paintings show a market image at the front, a display of a stand with fruits and, and vegetables and uh, meat. And then in the back have a religious image. So it really becomes the opposite of what you would have a religious image and then a background. In this case, you, you really focus in the middle of these people that are at the market and you see a scene there of Christ and the uh, woman, the adul adulteress. He did these very vigorous images of cooks. This is the cook in front of the stove. Very firmly positioned, the, the real hard worker uh, that is there with a whole array of meats and ready to put in the, in the fireplace. That also shows a display and the fact that at uh, that time, uh, some people had a pretty good life. And this uh, beautiful market scene here towards uh, the end of his life, uh, showing the man carrying that uh, kind of uh, bucket and some holding some faults in his hand. Very uh, beautifully represented. And it's going to have a lot of follower because it's going to be, don't forget the, uh, the Netherlands by, uh, 1585, the northern uh, provinces uh, secede from the low countries and are going to turn Calvinist. And so all the religious image, unless they are very uh, didactic, are disappearing. So these are becoming part of the subject matter that people really like. And this is what I'm showing you here is one of the only uh, religious uh, works that have been saved of all the ones he did and is even incomplete. As you can see, this is a triptych uh, with the adoration of the Magi. Uh, the right wing has disappeared, um, but it shows you the incredible talent of the man in, uh, with the variety of uh, staffing with around the, the painting very strong view of the Virgin uh, and baby Jesus, one of the kings uh, there and the big oxen and the ass on the other side and Joseph that is uh, bending towards the king. And then you have the other kings, the procession coming in. So, We've talked a lot about Germany, but we also going to have a little word about uh, the other reformed uh, countries. Uh, so the reformed church of England uh, in 1534, uh, the act of the royal supremacy is signed and the Henry becomes the head of the church of England. Uh, the successor in 1549, Edward VI will confiscate the endowments of chantries and foundations, um, which were the masses for the dead. The, in 1552, the second book of common prior proscribed stone altars. And I have to mention, and we, I should have written it, but prior to that, Henry had uh, dismantled all the monasteries in England too. And of course, had taken all the, the wells within the, for the country. Here uh, in 1553 to 58, Marie Tudor will restore the Roman Catholic Church. And in 59, Elizabeth renewed the royal supremacy and organized the national church. So this is an idea, this is by Hans Holbein, the title page of the Coverdale Bible uh, showing the 
an iconography that is much closer to what the Church of England do, does. Though uh, Henry wasn't uh, making a big change within the liturgy of uh, the church, it's mostly the idea of uh, the authority of the Pope. Though there will be uh, iconoclasm uh, on and off, particularly under Edward, uh, will be uh, iconoclasm. This is an example of a statue of the dead Christ that has been partly defaced. As you can see, the arms have been broken. Uh, and if you look at England, there is very little of the old uh, altarpieces or sculptures still existing. In France, you have the Huguenot. Uh, the Huguenot come actually from um, another uh, reformer than Calvin. His name was Hug, last name. And so this is probably from him that the name came. But they um, became much more numerous under Calvin. So Calvin, uh, who was born in 1509 and died in 64, will have to flee from France to Switzerland in 1534. Um, an enormous uh, series of wars and, and battles uh, will rage between 1562 and 98. And uh, these are the war of religions and then mostly triggered by, uh, let's say pushed by uh, Catherine of Medici uh, who uh, really wanted, uh, didn't want to hear anything about Protestantism, and so pushed her sons uh, to um, go and fight against the, the Protestants. There are some, I'm not going to go again too much into detail, but there's going to be a, a horrible uh, moment uh, after a lot of oppression and uh, reaction against the, the Huguenots. In 1572 will happen the San Barthelemy massacre where hundreds and hundreds of Protestants will be massacred, uh, thrown in the rivers, uh, burned and everything. In 1598, uh, the Edict of Nantes it will be signed by Henry IV, who was himself a Protestant originally and converted to Catholicism and gave the freedom to French Protestants where they could worship according to what they, they wanted. Unfortunately, in 1685, under Louis XIV, there is the revocation of Edith Nantes, where the Protestants, again, are going to be uh, prevented from worshipping. And uh, over 200 temples, meeting halls, will all be demolished after 1685. Uh, unfortunately, these uh, wars of religion, etc., are going to decimate the cultural patrimony. By the time of Louis XV's death in 1774, Calvinism had been nearly eliminated from France. Uh, but finally in 1787, the persecution of Protestants officially ends with the Edict of Versailles signed by Louis XVI. And there is a, um, not a very large amount, but there is uh, now some uh, Calvinists in France that, that are officially uh, worshiping their way. Just to give you an idea, this is uh, between 1520 until 1685 uh, in purple where the, the biggest areas of uh, the occupied by the Huguenots, as you can see, little islands. And then in white here is the Lutheranism. In light purple is, of course, when you have a little population. And here is an image of that famous um, San Bartholomew Day's massacre. This was really the climax of the, the French wars of religion. Uh, and you can see all this is uh, happening in uh, Paris. You can see to the left the church of the, the, Grand, the Grands Augustins still exist in uh, Paris. No, sorry, that one is uh, disappeared. I'm so sorry. Um, uh, 
and you can see uh, Catherine of Medici uh, there with the sword. Uh, this is the, the mill on Montmartre, actually. And then the rest are gates in Paris, and you can see people are hung and thrown through the windows, etc. It was a, an absolutely horrible day. So this gives you an idea of the atmosphere in Europe in the mostly the second part of the 16th century. Uh, the church is going to react, and uh, in 1545, though they refuse to listen to what Luther was saying. Uh, they decide they had to uh, fight against that very strong uh, reform movement and they're going to start what they call the counter-reformation uh, through three uh, big reunions of uh, cardinals and, and scholars uh, during the Council of Trent and this is going to run between 1545 and 1563 as I said they will have three uh, very uh, important meetings and uh, they're going to define, again, the authority of the Pope, the cult of Mary, uh, re-emphasize the transubstantiation, the real presence of uh, the body of Christ. Um, and then, uh, very important, and we'll see that uh, next time, uh, the importance of the veneration of saints, the relics of saints, and uh, the important, uh, importance of sacred images. Um, but they're going to supervise from then on that everything uh, is relevant to, um, it is really reading well the Bible and not uh, inventing. Uh, sorry. Uh, not inventing and in bringing in the composition figures that don't belong in there. And so this is going to be from the uh, end of the 16th century and particularly in the bar Baroque uh, era, any religious painting is supervised by some clerics who's going to give its absolution. You can do it or you cannot. And uh, this is going to be an interesting process. So. Next time, we'll look on May the 4th. Uh, the Counter-Reformation in Europe will talk about uh, painters that went through uh, that transition. We'll also look at some uh, women painters in the Renaissance that uh, we had had a chance to talk about. So I hope on this good term that you let me stop the recording.